Hi guys, welcome back to the Japan Archives, episode 60B. We're going to carry on the story of Yasuke today. So we're going to carry on, obviously, where we left off. It makes sense. <laughs> so we... Oh, so... <clears throat> how are you, Heather? <laughs> <laughs> I was jumping way quick into that. So how are you? No, I was like, I was raising, let's go for it. Oh, yeah, me. I had a, a decaf latte this morning. And I am bouncy, so if anyone, if you're listening, and if I seem more bouncy and energetic than normal, it's because apparently that the, the latte is really effective. So good! Right now, I'm doing great. How about you? Not too bad. I mean, as you know, I went to Marioka the other day to see my aunt uncle and my cousin so we just went there for a few days to relax and it was nice get away from everything get away from tokyo but now we're back now it's back to normal but that's about me really there's nothing else happening yeah that's i mean i went to starbucks to get the latte for takeout so yay i mean that's right yay things are happening things are but Anyway, like I said, we're going to carry on from where we left off. And we ended the episode with Yasuke and Alessandro finishing up their meeting at Hinoe Castle with Lord Arima. And so it was time for the two of them to return home. Though, like we said before, the territory was full of anti-Catholic people. And don't forget, they also had to leave from the castle, which was under siege. Now, where one meeting did end, we move on to Another, if you remember, the Jesuits and his entourage did not dock in Nagasaki when they first arrived. As they felt the Lord there, Omura Sumitada, was not giving them as much as he should be. And about this time now, he started to feel the pressure from it. A few things about him. In the past, he had not agreed to marry off his daughter to a Jesuit chosen man, and he did not wish to force his daughter to even do so. But he still needed the Jesuits and their guns, and so he ventured over to the mission building in Kuchinotsu with an offer he hoped that Alessandro and everyone else could not refuse. And in essence, he wanted to give them the entirety of Nagasaki. Not just the city, but all of the land surrounding it. Huh. No doubt, during this meeting, Yasuke would have been there, as ever being Alessandra's protector, and he would have seen the Lord sadly leaving with his hands empty. Alessandro did not accept the offer or the gift straight away. He kind of wanted to leave the man on tenterhooks, as, you know, he had already disappointed them, so might as well make him wait for a little bit. But he said he needed time to think it over, when I'm pretty sure he already knew he was going to take it. Thinking it over, he actually made him wait several months before making his decision. And it was during these months that they finally bid farewell to the ship that had brought them. The, what was the ship called? The Now? I think that was the type of the, the name of the ship merchant vessel and as they were saying farewell to the ship that had brought them they were also saying goodbye to all the children that were being boarded on board ship now like i said before alessandro was not against slavery if it helped his cause and so he and yasuke undoubtedly watched the boat filled with children most of which would have been less than 10 years of age. From what I can tell, these children would have been known as Suteko, which can be translated as the thrown away children. And in essence, the Jesuits believe that they were now sailing onwards to good Christian households where their souls would be saved. Mm, there's a lot to unpack there. That, mm, yeah, there's a little bit. There's a lot there. Oh, man. So were these children being sent to be adopted or and were they I'm guessing they were not given a choice I am assuming they didn't know what was happening they didn't know where they were going likely to China Macau or India but yes it says the Jesuits believed they would sail on to good Christian homes but nevertheless there is probably the high likelihood that they must 
that they would have just ended up into slavery. At this time in the world, slave trading was a big thing, and it was even a big thing in Japan. It's just, it's not really taught in their educational system. Like a lot of the stuff that they did in World War II is not taught in their educational system. But that is a big ass topic for another day as well. It kind of seems sad though. It's not that these children were being bought and taken from their homes. They were literally children that already had no home. They had no one to protect them or stop them from being taken. They literally had no choice. And I suppose in some regard, the Jesuits telling you to board this ship, you know, these people who come in and they're bringing hope and protection and all this, they might have believed they were genuinely going someplace better because right now in Japan, they were thrown away children. They were unwanted. Lots I, I want to say about the subject besides being, you know, things do happen in the course of history and to, to, to hear about them, even though you objectively know these things did happen, but to hear them in concrete evidence form is it's, it's really horrifying. And I, I really hope, I hope that, because we don't know for sure how many children there were. I'm, I'm, my only hope is that perhaps they did end up going to homes where they were treated as members of the family, even though I know that's not probable or possible in most of the cases, but I, I hope that they, because again, we don't know how their life would have been in Japan either. And you know, there were lots of children who kind of sold by their own parents as well. If they had a lot of children, they couldn't afford them. That, I mean, that happens, I think, in, happens in, I think, many countries. So it's, you would, you would, you would want to and hope and believe that the Jesuits would put them in a better place, but we don't, we don't know. I do wonder if there is anything written explaining what might happen if there are any known cases. But when I, when I came across that term, the Suteko, I did a bit of searching, but I didn't immediately find anything. So it's definitely something that needs a, a longer research. Or maybe it's something that isn't quite in English yet. And there might be some stuff written in the Japanese. So it's just a case of finding it and researching it a little bit. So that's something, maybe a future research project there. It's not going to be a fun topic, but... No, but it's it's important to know about. The more we know about history, the... Exactly. I, you always hope, the adage is said, the more you know about history, the, the less you are to repeat it. So it's important to learn. Even, even the difficult stuff is important to learn. True. Okay. So... As time went on, Yasuke did begin to work with the local military that Lord Arima left. He did leave them a few of his choice soldiers, and with them, he basically was left to devise defensive strategies for Alessandro, which included contingency and emergency escape plans should they be required. Later, Yasuke would find things got much easier for him when Alessandro hired his own Catholic militia. But right now, he and the small group of soldiers was all Yasuke had to help defend Alessandro. Over the next nine months, they continued to spend their time in the mission at Kuchinotsu, as well as another place as Kazusa, which was another seaport where the Lord had given the Jesuits several more buildings to control. In fact, he had given them here another Buddhist temple, which they then converted into the first Catholic seminary in all of Japan. Now, Alessandro undertook devising the entire thing, bringing in new acolytes to follow the Jesuit teachings. And during this time, Alessandro would rise early every day. Yasuke always up before him, before daybreak most of the time, scouting out the perimeter before always overseeing the preparation of his morning meals. After all, Yasuke couldn't afford poison getting into Alessandro's breakfast. So like I said, most days, at least for now, for Yasuke, were days of checking Alessandro's food, walking the perimeter, or, as there wasn't much of a threat at this point, standing guard during the Jesuits' many, many, many meetings, as well as his prayers. And so life continued that way for Yasuke until we find ourselves at Christmas 1579. 
At this point in Japan, the printing press had not arrived. In fact, it wouldn't arrive for another 11 years in 1590. And so Alessandro had to use many different plays and the like to teach the local people of the stories of the Bible. And so on Christmas Day, it said that we find Yasuke dressed as Balthazar, who was, according to the Catholic religion, the dark-skinned magi who gave the gift of myrrh to Jesus. And so in essence, on Christmas Day, the local people of Japan got a little play about the birth of Christ to try and teach them a bit more about the religion that they were adopting. Which I kind of think is an ingenious way to get across the language barrier. I want to come back to your thought, but could you please say the word M-A-G-I again? Magi. Ma oh, okay. I was like, because we say magi. Oh, uh, Huh. I, My dad says Magi, so I I say Magi. I just assumed that was a British pronunciation. Now I'm questioning if it is a British thing or if it's a, it's a, it's a dad thing. My dad thing. I don't know. I don't know, but I, I do when we run into words that I'm like, wait, what did you say? That's I <laughs> so much. Because then you sometimes we run, like I say something and you're like, what? You said that how? Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, the, the language barrier. Yeah, we've discovered teaching gestures are definitely universal for yeah. many people. And well, I mean, also storytelling and, you know, plays have traditionally been throughout history, you know, a way to communicate and to pass on mm. stories as well. So it was quite, quite brilliant of them to, to do that play. So I agree with you. And also really Really interesting because that the the Christmas nativity story has probably been done in what is it called pantomime in the UK the every mm. year so doing that pantomime is just a, a a long standing tradition that has been done for centuries and centuries. I do wonder if they've done it in pantomime. It would be interesting to see how they do it. I'm going to have to look into that now. Yay, more research. Always more research. So after Christmas for Yasuke, life did continue as before. Yasuke remaining on guard as Alessandro began to journey more and more around the island of Kyushu, visiting other mission buildings as well as other minor lords in the area who were sympathetic to their cause. Though, like we said, they'd taken a very long journey by boat to reach Japan, they did still now find themselves traveling a lot by boat as traveling by road in mountainous japan especially back in those time was very impractical especially when you also factor in the lords the other lords in the area who also were again against catholicism and so as 1579 draws to a close Alessandro and Yasuke receive word from their mission in Kyoto, saying that Obu Nobunaga, Oda Nobunaga, had suffered an embarrassing defeat. And this being the man who would become the great unifier of Japan. But also at this time, he was a man whom the mission in Kyoto relied on for protection. And so Alessandro made plans that perhaps they would have to make time eventually to make their way to Kyoto in the future with the hope of meeting this lord. But either way, now a year had passed in Japan for the two of them, and there had been no deaths in the Jesuit ranks. Here I want to go back to the strange beliefs that Alessandro had a little bit. This one going into race. Let's not forget, obviously, he had completely entrusted his life, in essence, to an African man, into Yasuke. But Alessandro did hold firm to the belief that Africans were incapable of understanding Christianity, that they were strangers to all human refinement, lacking culture, talent, and intelligence. And yet we still find this man entrusting his life to a man who comes from this place, which is very hypocritical in essence. Well, his treating of Yasuke is more of a tool and yeah. not as, as an object and not as a human, and which says a lot about his personality and inadequacy of his personality to think that. That's ridiculous because obviously Yasuke, he's guarding he cooks he's also done acting so obviously this yasuke is got 
probably many talents. Many True. Talents. And one of the other talents he had was Yasuke was by now becoming proficient in the Japanese language, no doubt through standing guard during Alessandro's many meetings, as well as lessons he was having in the language. And almost ironically, unlike Yasuke, Alessandro never could quite get the hang of Japanese, whereas Yasuke could. Hmm. Obviously, Alessandro had incorrect beliefs, very wrong beliefs. Not just that, but Yasuke was also showing him his... Mm his it's really i mean to be able to grasp you know japanese especially when you i mean i don't know if they, they he practiced the written language or just just all listening that's really impressive really mm. impressive as, as both you and i can speak over i am no ways proficient um, mildly mildly adequate is probably a nice compliment that i still think is overreaching but and the thing is, you, you kind of wonder too, like Alessandra thinks of Yasuke as a lesser being, not even person. Like he doesn't even believe him to be a person. You kind of mm. wonder also how Alessandra thinks about the people in Japan. I can tell you. Reading around this idea of race back then, obviously the ideas of black and white in the modern context do stem from like 18th, 19th century bad science. You know, white people came from the Romans, black people came from monkeys. That was what they said at that time. But back in this time, the idea was there was white and there was black. But in essence, dark skin meant unchristian. And so they had all these racial stereotypes about anyone who wasn't Christian because at the time... Islam and the Moors were a big thing that were against Christianity and they were obviously of darker skin and a lot of them also lived in Africa. So the idea of dark skin meant unchristian and therefore if you're unchristian, you know, you're unenlightened, you're uncultured and all these things. And that was the reason behind it. Similarly, because in Asia, Japanese and Chinese skin is more closer to white, they saw Japanese people and Chinese people even more civilized than Europeans, and they classed them as white. You got me on that one. I was not expecting that. I was expecting that Alessandro was thinking that he was the superior and everyone else was inferior. I was not expecting to have a more level of equality for one one race, but yet not another. And it's, mm. I mean, honestly, it's horrifying and terrible and frankly I, I just would say downright stupid <laughs> which is strong for me to say you know um but yeah no his his ideas and his opinions about race were like to think of yasuke as as not even human completely completely just wrong just wrong we'll just make it simple mm. and say just wrong and i love i, I love that yasuke was way more proficient in Japanese, I, especially because it's such a hard, and especially back then, it had to be even more difficult because a lot of it more of was based on like the Chinese kanji and the characters too. Mm. So not having a printing press, everything being handwritten. And so, I mean, honestly, Yasuke, like that, <laughs> all the other things that Yasuke's done, I admire him, but that right there, I'm like, oh, wow, that is, that is like the <laughs> super impressive. I, it, it's very impressive. People are dumb sometimes. Anyway, go Yesuke. A product of their upbringing. I mean, it was what fifteen hundred, so yeah, that's that's a long time ago. We don't know how we don't know how things were back then. Still, looking back now, horrible and terrible, yeah. and flat mm. out wrong. Flat out wrong. Indeed. This is a tough one. Mm. So. The new year has rolled around. Spring has dawned in 1580, and they all have now moved to Nagasaki. You know, they finally accepted the generous gift of the city and all its lands. And in essence, the Jesuits are now in complete control after the Lord had offered it to them. In fact, they even passed a law stating that only Catholics could reside in the city, which then goes back to the whole he considered Yasuke Catholic, even though 
he believed Africans weren't capable of understanding Christianity. Again, going into the hypocrisy, perhaps, of him, or even just he was happy to overlook anything that, as long as it suited his needs. I mean, yeah, Yasky's cooking for him, so he needs to eat. Mm -hmm. True. And it was here, like, we mentioned early in the episode that Yasuke gained the new role of chaining the local militia and these included refugees from around the area as well as Ronin warriors who no longer had a master. Here Yasuke now dwelt in the new mission building which was located in a well fortified position on a promontory so I am sure Yasuke felt a little more at ease here that as long as they were here in essence protecting Alessandro would have been much easier than it would have been at Kuchinotsu. And here the two of them actually remained until September of 1580 watching the port town of Nagasaki grow and grow as more of the Catholic faith joined them in this place. But again, eventually it was time to move on. Yasuke would be heading east with Alessandro to the lands owned by Otomo Sorin on Kyushu. And from there, they had plans to head to the mainland and make their way to Kyoto and closer to Oda Nobunaga. In a land full of threats for Alessandro, Yasuke once again had his work cut out for him in Lord Sorin's domain, this domain known as Bungo Province. He had the largest and most powerful of the lands on Kyushu, and his ex-wife was very unhappy with him after he decided to leave her and marry in the Christian fashion. His wife, who we now no longer know the name of, we only know her as Lady Nata or Jezebel. I'm guessing she didn't pick that name. No, it was given to her by the Jesuits. Do you know who Jezebel was in the Bible? I do, indeed. No, Jezebel. Oh, good, you can enlighten me because I feel that it's a bad name to be given. Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab, and this was the time of the prophet Elijah. There is an Elijah and an Elisha, and Elijah came first. So this was Elijah. Okay. Essentially, there was a vineyard owned by a man named Naboth, and they wanted that vineyard. So Jezebel said that Naboth had blasphemed against God, causing him to be stoned. Elijah then confronted Ahab and said that his he and his heirs would be destroyed and Jezebel would be eaten by dogs. And oh. yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what happened. Is that Eventually, he's not Ahab, a good person. Ahab went to battle, he died, and then Jezebel was eaten by dogs. Yeah, so not a good person. I mean, mm. to, to be fair, I mean, Ahab, I don't think was, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but there's your general story. Okay, cool. Thank you. So anyway, this wife known as Jezebel shaved her head after the whole husband leaving her thing she shaved her head tried to kill herself was put on suicide watch and even threatened to take her daughters into the wilderness to die as punishment for the lord leaving her now to make matters even worse she quite rightly hated the jesuits as that was the way her husband managed to leave her and she also remained a very powerful woman even after the lord left her she had connections in the noble houses and she was also a priestess or a high priestess in fact of the war god Hachiman and so retained many followers including no doubt having access to the ninja which did dwell in the area at this time. So not only has Yasuke now got to deal with a grand priestess who hates the Jesuits, but he also has to now be aware of ninja threats that might be coming for Alessandro due to Jezebel's power and connections. In fact, during their stay in Bungo, the house of the daughter of his new wife did catch fire. No other buildings did at the time, and she barely made it out alive. Alessandro deciding to give her a rosary and solace for what had happened. So, oh. like again, I said, Yasuke was once again on high alert. I feel that like maybe a rosary is not good enough when you nearly die in a house fire, but Sorry, you also almost if died. you're Here very... You if you're also very devoutly Catholic and, you know, the man who is, in essence, the most powerful 
Catholic man in all of Japan. You know, he gives you this gift, I suppose. It might be the best gift you've ever received. I don't know. The fact it's it's actually brought out in the, the fact it's it's stated is very mm. unusual. Like, oh, well, apparently I, she was very happy and she cried when she received the gift. Yeah, since so. neither one of us are Catholic, we don't know the rosary. Perhaps it's it was especially back then. Perhaps it was a very expensive. Mm. Item that not everyone had, or maybe it was a specific type of rosary. Perhaps the yeah, I, I confess ignorance. If someone knows about the about rosaries, please help please us. let us know. Let us mm -hmm. know. <laughs> but despite all of this, Alessandro, as ever, was undaunted. He had many things he wanted to accomplish while he was in Bungo. First, he wanted to build another seminary. This one right under the protection of the Lord's Castle. Second, he wanted to gather together a group of young Japanese nobles and send them on a pilgrimage to Europe. And finally, they needed to find money to fund their trip to Kyoto to meet with Obunobunaga in person. So Yasuke was closer than ever to meeting the most powerful man in Japan at this point. And so this leads us to a new threat that Yasuke might potentially have had to deal with. To get to Kyoto, it was going to take another week or two of travel, and quite a big portion of it by sea, because obviously Kyushu does not have Kyoto, it's on a completely different island. Mm. And this ocean at the time was not just full of, but it was in essence controlled by pirates. Now, of course, if one could pay at all, then you could gain safe travel. And so they did pay, earning the protection of a pirate known as Lord Murakami of Noshima, who in fact is said to have been the most powerful of all the pirates at this time. At this point, March of next year has rolled around and Yasuke finally finds himself boarding a ship to Kyoto. Yasuke was very wary. After all, five years prior, these pirates who were now taking them had been allies to the Mori clan, who at that time, and were still now, heavily anti-Catholic. So there was the potential for, you know, backstabbing or betrayal, but it did fortunately all work out, and the pirates, if you could say this, were to be trusted. <laughs> As they traveled, they stopped off at islands along the way, Yasuke and the others sleeping at small forts, or even in the pirate bases themselves as they made their way to Kyoto. And eventually, after all of the sailing, they reached the city of Sakai, known to Europeans at the time as the Venice of Japan. Oh, was it a, a ocean-based city? Well, according to the book I've been reading, Sakai was an attractive settlement of rivers and canals, which is no doubt why it got the nickname of the Venice of Japan. Ah. And so, in the city of Sakai, here Yasuke and the others are welcomed by, again, a group of warriors, this time sent by Nobunaga's most senior generals, a man by the name of Takayama Ukon. And so, after disembarking the boat, they move on to the estate of a man known as Konishi Ryusa, and he apparently was one of the first people here to have converted to Catholicism. Here they could rest a while, and they were to leave the next day to Osaka. A grand procession to lead the way, but their plans did go slightly awry, as during the procession, people were desperate and clambering all around to get a sight of Yasuke. The crowds grew and grew, more to see him than the actual retinue of Alessandro and the Jesuits. The soldiers at the time attempting to control the growing throng, and in fact we know that the guards were taunted and jostled, and that even a roof collapsed at the time as too many people stood on it to get a sight of Yasuke. And also the streets were so crowded of people trying to see him that people fell through many paper doors and windows as they lost their footing in the crowd. In the end, Yasuke was forced to mount a horse so that people could more easily see him, but also so he could more easily push his way through the unruly crowds. 
so they could continue on to Osaka. So apparently Yasuke had many, 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 many fans. Mm -hmm. Very popular. They're spending their time here now. And it, Easter? Easter week is ending as they get closer to Kyoto. Yasuke and the entourage during this time have continued to be entertained by Takayama Ukon, who we have just mentioned. And he was actually a very devout man. He was very devout to Catholicism, and he genuinely cared for the religion and not just the guns which came with it. The Easter Sunday festivities drew to a close with a messenger finally arriving for Lord Ukon, and after reading it, he addressed Yasuke and the others, stating, Fathers and brothers in Christ, we have been done great honor. Lord Nobunaga has requested us to proceed with all haste to his presence. You will be seen within mere days. And so, on March 27th, 1581, Yasuke with Alessandro and a large retinue of Jesuits, powerful people from Nagasaki, Bungo, Omura, Arima, and Sakai, as well as 25 choir boys, all with banners and icons of the Catholic face raised high, finally entered into Kyoto with plans to meet Odu Nobunaga in person. And that's where I'm going to leave it today. Mildly disappointed we did not talk about this on March 27th. We are a few days early, but I, I also did the math. 440 years ago, almost exactly 440 years ago, that that happened. <laughs> Oh yeah, 1581. So in a week's time, yeah, in a week's we time. can say 440 years ago, Yasuke entered Kyoto for the first time. Wow, this there was a lot that happened in this today. There was a lot of traveling. Yeah, there, was a lot. there was a lot of danger. I'd love to know more about the pirates. I, I want to know more about Japanese pirates now. I'm super intrigued. We actually have pirates on our future episodes list because I... Oh my gosh, where did I go? I, went I don't somewhere. know. I remember you sent me a picture yeah. of like a display board you found which mentioned pirates. I... Ah! <laughs> Okay, Eddie. <laughs> yeah, where was that? I think I feel like it was around here somewhere that I saw it. Yeah, so it must have been around here because I think it was when I first came. Yeah, because we were really exploring around like Hiroshima Prefecture. We went to Shikoku. I feel like it was around Shikoku area or the Shimanani, 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 Shimanani Kaido. That's hard to say. Yeah, pirates are on our list. We have to look those up. I feel like it was around this time as well that there was a pirate, uh, one of the most famous pirates in China, who was it was a woman, and I cannot recall her name, but she was incredibly impressive. I, I want to study her, even though she's, I don't think it's... Ha if you can find some tangential tie to Japanese history, I would love to talk about her as well, because her story is also really fascinating. I'm always down to talk about new things. As evidenced by how many things we pulled up in just this podcast today. Exactly. Oops. But apart from that, how did you find today's episode? I think I wasn't expecting so much to happen today. I, I think after mm. last week, because we, we, you had built up to get us set up for the next part of the story. And I, I wasn't expecting to go through like so much. And there's just so much to unpack from this. And it's really fascinating. And I, I still want to hear from Yasuke, but hearing about Yasuke is kind of filling in that picture of him in a way. True. Right now, I'm, I'm not so interested in Alessandra. <laughs> I want to know about Yasuke. Like, join the Yasuke fan club along with everyone who wanted <laughs> to see him. I just I just picture, like, like there's the, the um, uh, people who are, like, wanting to see the idols and mm. you know, screaming and cheering. And I'm just picturing this kind of reception for Yasuke. And... I I love that, and I wonder if, like, Al I wonder I wonder if Alessandro was was jealous that Yasuke was more well known, 
and more popular, it seems like, than Alessandro. Yeah, I do wonder how he felt during that procession. Did he feel betrayed in a way that the eyes weren't on the Jesuits? Or did he not care because more people were there? Or was he was he arrogant and thought, of course, they would never want to see Yasuke because he's not human. He's, of course, they want to see me. So you never know. Also that. It's also really interesting to get some history about Nagasaki as well. Because I did, I did know that Nagasaki has been traditionally... A Christian city in mm. Japan. It was. It's. It still feels very Christian. Like when I went with my parents, you you still get that vibe about it. And that that comes into an interesting topic later on. But I'm going to leave that for now. But it is interesting to find out that Nagasaki had been given to the Jesuits. I had I had no idea about that. Mm. Like they literally owned the city. And. Also, that tie into Oda Nobunaga as well. That's we we haven't talked. We haven't specifically had an episode about Oda Nobunaga. There's so much to say about him. He would. It's a bit like Yasuke. He there would be several episodes. So whether we do it as a series together, but I feel that that would be a super long one. The amount of battles he was in, the amount of stuff that he's done. I mean, he has ties to Yasuke. We've mentioned to him before, I think in episode seven, where the ninja made the assassination attempt on him. Like so many things have happened to him. I don't know if you could actually fit it all in into a nice three part episode or we would just have to pick one thing. I bet like we've been doing with the Shinto stuff. We just pick one aspect of it and slowly add to his story over the going months of this show. Also, not a bad idea to talk about just specific aspects, but... A bit like we did with Basho. Yeah, we still have to, to come back, which will actually come into play today with the poem, but... <gasps> it's a Basho? <laughs> it is a Basho. We're back to Basho. Was it, that, was a, that was a transition. Oh my God, we just transitioned. We don't normally transition that easily, so... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all of that research and for condensing it down. That is, I really need to read that book. I really keep forgetting. I want to read it as well. And you keep reminding me. That's all right. I'm super it. excited to see what happens next week. So I'm, I'm intrigued to see how the meeting with Odu Nobunaga goes. I mean, we know how badly it ends for Christianity in Japan, but we haven't got there yet. So I want to see how well it goes initially. For the two of them when they meet. Yeah, me too. That is... Ah, uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to the next installment. But Basho. Basho. Okay. Do you know, I, I've i been thinking this week, and I had some ideas about things I wanted to do and I wanted to talk about, but I felt like being... I don't know if simple is the right word, but I felt, I felt that I wanted to have... A, almost a get back to a basic... Yeah. Or get back to a fundamental, to a building block. <laughs> but to not, it, it just, it, this week felt like it, we needed, we're going to have the story of Yasuke. So I wanted to have something a little bit more relaxed. Familiar? Ref ah, beautiful. Thank you so like much. Like a cornerstone. Yes, a cornerstone. Oh, that's a beautiful word. Oh, thank you so much for giving me a hand with that. We're so good with words after <laughs> translating that song for my friend yesterday. Hi, AG. I know he listens to the show when he's cycling around, so. Oh, that's awesome. Hi, thank you. I love your song. Oh, so back to back to Bashol. Simple cornerstone, etc. Which also a revisitation because this is something we talked about. And I looked Almost a year ago, we talked about this. So I'm going to tell you the poem and see if you can remember it. I feel like you know this. And I feel like even if you are not familiar with Japanese poetry or Japanese haiku, you know this poem. Furu ikea, kawazu tobikomu, mizu no oto. I do remember it, if I'm honest. I want you to think about Basho and think about I said the word Mizu. And what poem can you think of with Basho that has Mizu in it? Right now, my brain is remembering 
the banana plant. <laughs> but this is not the banana plant one. <laughs> no. That was the one that started Basho Uete. This is the most well known of Basho's poems. As soon as I say this, you're going to go, oh my gosh, I knew this. You ready? No, I kind of want to remember, but that I, sound not... you just made actually is kind of related to the, to the. <laughs> what? Blah, 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 blah. Sort of. No, then no, no, I remember now. He's the most famous one. We did, we did it because we've done a lot of Basho poems. It was on the one that was beginning Basho. So what? Well, that was episode forty. Oh man, you're remembering the episode. 45, wow. Yeah. That was a while ago now. It Episode was. 45. So that was the one of the frog jumps into a pond and breaks the quietness of the surroundings? Yeah, yeah. An ancient frog, a pond jumps ah. in a splash of water. But literally, there's so many translations mm. for this poem that I like yours as well. Breaking the sound of silence is is beautiful. So... Yeah, we mentioned it, but we didn't really we didn't really talk about it. No, I remember. Didn't we? We started the show by you read his most famous poem, and we didn't really delve into it. We kind of glossed over it, which was a shame. Yeah, so it's nice that you're doing the callback. Yeah, callback to episode forty five, beginning by show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt I just wanted to do this poem today. It just felt right, and it's not. I, I don't know. Just I just felt inspired. Also, it's getting warmer. It's getting spring. It's going to be frog soon. There's just birds everywhere. Birds and bees and all that fun stuff. So should be some frogs as well. So you'll hear those. What do you think about this poem? To me, it gives me the impression of like you can be stuck, like taking you out of a moment. Hmm. Because, like, the breaking of the silence is like the breaking of a thought or losing track of your concentration. I don't know why I get that impression, but that's what it gives me. I, I quite like that because I, I was talking to the professor before we recorded, and he had mentioned that this... He's behind me, isn't he? He's going now. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with the professor, and he said that this idea is to describe silence, and that's I think that's one that is when there are several interpretations of this poem. As I, I did some some reading, and I found one person who had very strong opinions about this poem, <laughs> and had very several different interpretations, and okay. there's different, different translations, and it's been studied for centuries. So I like that you mentioned that that silence that's what the professor mentioned because for me i was feeling it was is an atmosphere of like of peace and and quiet and being like serene in nature so i guess in a way i i kind of had the sense of silence but not so strong as as you had so i, I love that you you came with that interpretation the professor said the interesting thing about this haiku is how he composed it. Mm. So I, th I think we had mentioned that there was, I know we've mentioned that there was often several, like the, the poets would get together and have a theme and compose verses based on that theme and have like the poetry competitions. Yeah. Well, this one was composed by Basho in one of those meetings. And the, the theme was frogs. They chose a, a theme about frogs. And this is the one that Basho wrote. So I, I thought that, you know, my idea was that he would have been out near his miscanthus buds and his banana plant and have heard this frog and composed it out in nature. But it was actually composed in a, a lit literary gathering, which I, I thought was fascinating. Because I suppose in those literary gatherings, the poem has to be more spontaneous. Like there was a there must have been like a time limit to compose the poem. Yeah, and I do I do remember reading as well, I forget where I found this, but B Basho thought that to compose a haiku, it must be done quickly. To have to sit there and think about it too long, almost in effect, not ruins it, but it, it goes against the effect of the haiku being just very short and observational. So yeah, it was done rather rapidly. 
So it's interesting you say if if the theme was frogs, it's now considered a poem about silence. That's the interesting thing about haiku is that you have a theme, you have to have mm-hmm. nature, but it's not always just about nature. There's another slight meaning or meanings behind it as well. So you have to have nature. It has to be an element in a haiku that is, you know, or season. Mm. There's the, um, that, that feeling of the season and nature must be in a haiku to be considered a haiku. But it's not just describing nature. It's describing something within nature. So very huh, reflective, which is funny because we're talking about water. <laughs> That was not intentional fun, but really great. So that idea of using nature to analyze different thoughts and feelings and ideas. And you could really go into so many other different aspects of the poem. And I don't know about you, but I'm I'm not always the most, mm, I'm not the best person to look into very, very deep meanings for poetry. Mm. So, I'm not, I'm not super critical. It's just, it's just me, which is fine. Everyone is different and we all have to be different. We all have different strengths and we have different things that we like and we enjoy, but we can all appreciate poetry to some extent, even if we can't sit there and write like a 10 page paper analyzing poem, still appreciate it and still enjoy the beauty of it. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you for the poem this week. I feel like we could, we could go even more into depth into it, but I maybe we can come back and revisit it again one day, but I just don't. I want to just enjoy the enjoy this poem and walk away for now. Well, I can't wait to see what you bring next week for us then. Probably not frogs, which is sad. <laughs> I think there's a lot of poems about frogs. <laughs> which, by the way, the sound that a frog makes in Japan is more like kero kero. Kero kero. Yeah, not ribbit ribbit. I do have a song about frogs. Oh, okay, maybe maybe I'll, I'll remember that for another episode. I think I know a song about frogs as well. Maybe it's <gasps> the same one. All right, well, thank you, Heather, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed part two of episode 60. We'll see if we do finish up the tale next week, but if not, it might be our first four-parter, which I am not against. Show notes, as ever, up on the website. I'm going to be redesigning the homepage this week, the start of next week, so maybe by next episode, I'll let you know if that's all done, but I'll also tell you, Heather, so you can have a look and let me know. But until then, guys, Well, sorry about the drilling in the background there, guys. I don't know where that came from. Japanese and their thin walls. But anyway, um, thank you all for tuning in this week. The drilling has thrown me off. (laughs) Matane. (laughs) Matane.